Hello and welcome back to another video and when I first saw this video uh, it was actually on uh, Canadian Gamers channel he'd made a video about this video and I didn't know that this video had uh, actually existed because this is Martin McNeil um, he started up a new YouTube channel he has he, I mean he admits in the description he's not a YouTuber he's just sort of joined recently and he's got about 100 odd subscribers at the time of making this video um, so uh, it just caught me completely out of the blue, because I mean, uh, quite rightly, so after she and oh god, those awful people, Lady Decade and Top Hat Gaming scam, after they did their thing, uh, it's just quite right that Martin McNeil, the photographer who took the picture of Ray Harryhausen, which she claimed to know nothing about, makes his own video about it and calls them out for the liars that they are. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see how things pan out from this. I mean, I'm not, at the time of making this video, as I make it now, I'm watching this video blind. Um, I've not seen it before. Uh, I mean by that. Uh, now I'm aiming. It's, it's a strange week this week. I've made a video about RGT85's Amico video, which I've done in two parts. I want to get that online, but um, <laughs> every time I sort of think, right, I'll put part one of that on. And I sort of want to, you know, spread it out by two days. Then along comes something else, and there's, there's something more immediate. Uh, Monday, the 10th of October, was a year since the in television Amico was last since to come out. So I put a video up about that with John Riggs with his deleted video, which I thought was I thought a video he just made private, but no, he'd actually deleted his five reasons not to buy the Amico video, which was supposedly a spoof. But oh, how that aged badly! And then um, along comes this, and this is uh, pretty damn timely, so I'll make this video and I'll upload it to YouTube. And the truth is, every time I make a video that, that mentions Lady Decade, I don't know why, YouTube's stupid algorithm thinks, oh, it's uh, not suitable for advertisers. But it's no different from any other of these kind of videos that I make. All the others are fine. And this one just seems to get picked up by it. So if I upload it and then I end up, knocking it on by a day or two it's because I'm waiting for YouTube to sort their stuff out so yeah we'll see how things go anyway let's get into it I mean you'll 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 know what uh, Lady Decade has been up to claiming uh, they use a, a picture of his of yeah Ray Harryhausen at the start of this video this is why it's seven seconds in when I start this at the start of this video, he shows a picture, that picture of Ray Harryhausen, along with the words, I feel totally comfortable sharing this video. And I could have included that and gone the fair use route, because this would be fair use, because I'm showing his video about it all, because uh, I'm commenting on it. But <laughs> I, it's not like a video, so I've not, gone, I've not done what Lady Decade did and just stolen um, the picture and just, just stuck it in the video willy-nilly. Um, but I, 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 I it's, yeah, I mean, I'm supporting what Martin McNeil's done. Um, so it's at this point, it's probably unlikely that you just think, oh right, well, Dom's used my video, so um, as part of fair use, so I'm just going to sting him with it anyway. But I'm just, I'd rather just not go there. Now, if it does pop up at all during during this video, because it may just be him talking, um, I'm just going to go with it. But I'm just using your video, Martin, as is, from this point onwards. Okay, let's go. Hello, and where to begin? I'm Martin McNeil, currently a fourth year law student, formerly an editorial and commercial photographer, but mostly I'm a full-time dad to three boys. I'm the guy that my dogs like to ragdoll a little and take them out for walks. And I'm married to an awesome woman who's put up with my puns and deadpan dad jokes for over 20 years now. I wonder if uh, Lady Decade and Top Hat Gaming Scam I think they're married to such awesome people, i.e. each other. Um, <laughs> and I've got subtitles on this because, uh, I mean, I, 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 think, I think they were just still on from when I was, yeah, I had them on when I was covering the video of the guy just before uh, John Riggs. The reason there was no subtitles on the John Riggs video was just because uh, that was on Odyssey rather than YouTube. Um, so it's just stayed on there. But I mean, <clears throat> Martin McNeil, he does have quite a strong Scottish accent, so I know people from all over the world will watch this video. So 
Um, I'm picking it up okay myself, but other people around the world might not pick up on it if you're not used to the accents. So, um, yeah, so we'll keep the uh, uh, subtitles up. And I can see what he's said here, but I'll just, in case he's already started the sentence, I'll just uh, go back a few seconds because um, that does seem a very good, <laughs> a very good line. Married to an awesome woman who's put up with my puns and deadpan dad jokes for over 20 years now. I'm not going to show you pictures of my wife or kids because who does that? Booyah! <laughs> That's classic, that. Um, obviously, what Lady Dickay did is when she claimed while sitting in front of thousands of pounds worth of uh, equipment, so, you know, gaming equipment and games, um, she then claimed, I have been sued for £500. I don't have that money. But yeah, of course she has the money. They're both the fucking scammers. They really are. I fucking hate them. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's a brilliant start from Martin. I like that. Besides, <laughs> people put their kids in videos. God, even the dogs are shocked. <laughs> it wouldn't be relevant to what I have to say. Most of you watching this will know that on August 6th of this year, I found myself in a situation that came out of left field regarding a YouTube video and some tweets that preceded and followed it. And in the wake of all that, there's been a lot of wild speculation. At August 6th. So at the time of, uh, I'm making this video on Monday, October the 10th. I guess I say it just depends on how long YouTube take to um, process it and in case it throws up a, a stupid advertisers thing. Um, yeah, I could publish it if it says... Um, the, uh, you have the advertisers, it's not suitable for advertisers. But I know that by appealing it, they will uh, they will overturn that anyway when a manual human looks at it. So, but I say in the meantime, the same thing that RGT came up with, with his copyright claim. When there's a problem like that, YouTube will just bury it in the algorithm so they won't share it out to other people. So it's... Um, yeah, if you can, it's unless something's really, really timely. If you can, it's just best waiting a day or two. They do say when they review them on the tool, it says it can take up to seven days, but uh, it's usually a day or two, and it's fine. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how we go. But um, yeah, August sixth, so it's only two months. It feels like about about six months. But um, yeah, what a what a what a summer it's been, eh? Mm. Wilder allegations and some frankly unsavoury stuff which I won't waste my breath on. But it's now time to address a few things that have been put out over the last few days and weeks. Before I get into it, I want to start out by saying that for at least 12 years now, I've been a very vocal artist rights advocate, particularly on the issues of artists being paid fairly, in full and on time. More importantly, I've spoken frequently about the need for those in creative industries to be respectful of each other's work and rights. It's a big part of why I ended up starting my law studies with a view to advocacy and consultancy regarding intellectual property rights and law lecturing as my day job to support that work. I'm old enough to remember the days before Napster when the internet was a place where creative works were shared around on platforms such as CompuServe, AOL, Usenet Bulletin. God. I, I remember all those as well. I remember the days before Napster um, and... I didn't use CompuServe or CompuSpend, as it's, I know it was called. We just, people just seemed to... I mean, I used dial-up services where you had to... You basically paid by the minute to get onto the internet. And it just cost a, it cost a fortune, whichever service you used. Um, I think I just dialed up through BT. And I remember... <laughs> I remember, remember one time I was using my... This was... God, this was... Um, I was connecting to a, a friend's bulletin board. This would be in the God, it would be the early 90s. I still had my Atari ST, and I connected through yeah through like I dialed into his bulletin board because he had a I was able to connect you know, online as it were uh, with my Atari ST, and he dialed up through the modem uh, to get online. And then there was one time when I yeah I finished. I was going to bed. I logged off. Switched off the Atari ST, went to bed. That was probably about midnight. Then uh, seven hours later, my dad gets up, and he uh, he just uh, goes to use the phone. See, so, yes, it's about seven a.m. and he hears internet noises coming down the phone, and he's like, starts. He comes into my room. He's like, 
why are you on the internet at 7am? And I was waking up like, well, I'm not. And basically, long and the short of it is what happened was, <laughs> I'd switched off, I'd to try to, you know, gone to do the log off thing on my ST, switched off the ST before it sort of received its command back to switch off the internet. And as such, the internet had stayed connected. And it stayed connected for seven hours until Dad spotted it. And, uh, of course, then I switched the ST back on and logged off properly. Um, but bloody hell, I, did, I, oh, I just pulled the cables out. I can't remember now. It was a long time ago. God, at least um, that's getting on for like almost 30 years ago. Uh, just absolutely bizarre. And I don't know how, well, yeah, I was going to say, I don't know how that happened. But it just happened, obviously, because it hadn't connected to sort of come back to me to, to sort of handshake back and say, yeah, we're disconnected. Um we got on to BT and said, "Can they? You know, this is the situation. This is what's happened. We're sorry. Can you um, waive the bill, etc.?" They said, "No, thank you very much, BT, you bastards." And uh, that was fifty quid down the drain. Yeah, fifty quid for a night's internet doing nothing. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, BT. Boards, largely without ill intent, but even back then people began to realise that even the best of intentions can sometimes give rise to consequences that lean towards the negative. When I started out in editorial photography, Facebook was barely on the scene, Twitter hadn't yet been launched, and Instagram was a few years away from existing. Yeah, so I think basically what he's driving at is that people would take any pictures they found and just shove them anywhere on the internet that they could because they just didn't, didn't even think about it. It's like, it's like when you stumble on you just like flicking through the news feed on Facebook. And all it seems to be is just people, they don't even comment on them. People just post a status, which is just showing some old meme or, you know, video or, uh, they don't say why they, they like it. I say no contacts, but they just post, you know, the old memes, old pictures, old anything. Oh, yeah, as if so, oh, isn't this hilarious? They may well be, but yeah, we've seen it a hundred frigging times. Why don't you just, if you're going to show it again after everyone, everyone's seen it a hundred times, why don't you just put a comment on it to say, you know, in the status, to say this is why I'm sharing it because I find it funny because da da da. And so it just gives no context and it's just really bloody annoying and it's those people who usually end up hiding away for 30 days because they just get on my tits so they keep doing it. And some people do just, just that's all they post. And it's just bloody annoying. <sighs> Facebook is shit. Even YouTube was the new kid on the block, an independent company that wouldn't be bought out by Google until late of 2006. These social media services, which encourage the sharing of images, videos and other media, are corporate entities headquartered in the United States and they make use of an exam not an example, an exemption that was carved out in law back in 1998, the DMCA. In simple terms, if these services expeditiously remove any copyright content from their platforms at the request of a rights holder, they can't then be sued by the owners of that media. That's a core function of the DMCA, which has survived intact for almost 25 years now. Because he mentions in the uh, description, Martin, that uh, he did flub a few lines, but that he's not a YouTuber. Hey, I flub my lines all the time, and I'm just making this up on the fly. But I can see what he's done is <clears throat> you can record your video, and sort of upload that and then you can download the subtitles that are auto generated and then correct any mistakes as a sort of um, if it sort of misspelt any words or you want to sort of capitalize anything or uh, yeah put extra punctuation in or extra words just to like the way but um, that he flubbed it so you know extra words in like that <clears throat> you can do that and then upload it back so that uh, and in this format so that it sets it out so the words are appearing in whole sentences at a time rather than one word at a time. This is relevant because if we fast forward to July 31st of this year, I found one of my photographs had been used in a video. Okay, so I didn't know this was coming up, but um, I'm I'm using this with fair use. It's been used in his video that he's using. Don't sue me, Martin. <laughs> I'm with you on this. So, um, yeah, I, I can't help it that it's in the middle of your video that I'm commenting on. Top Hat Gaming Scam. 
They've been published on a YouTube account titled Top Hat Gaming Man Channel. At first glance, there was no real world name or address to be found on the about page for that channel. So despite the channel being clearly monetized, I filed a DMCA takedown notice just after 6 p.m. that day. And past experience of trying to contact channel owners directly has been, uh, let's just say there's no matter how polite, professional I am when asking, the replies I get are rarely you know, mirror that tone. I did see, I'm not sure whether it's in the comments on this one or on somewhere else, someone commented that one of their, I'm not going to go through all the comments on this video because there's bloody loads of them. Um, someone commented that um, they had something, some content taken by Top Hat Gaming Scam and they tried to ask you know, for them to remove it or com compensate them in some way and Top Hat Gaming Scam just told them where to go basically. So yeah, it's the kind of people they are. Uh, nothing more than a hunch, I went back again the next day to have another look over the channel and use the email address that was published there as a basis for a web search. That soon led to me finding out that Top Hat Gaming Man was a pseudonym for a Mr. Richard Varty. It was represented Farty Varty? Farty Pops. Presented by a YouTuber talent agency called Colossal Influence. A <laughs> well, I've certainly had Colossal Influence on that one. Which of company's house turned up an address for this agency. So I typed up a letter requesting pay. Well, I'm glad he didn't include that in the video, otherwise, uh, I'd, have, I'd definitely have had to edit that out. Of a standard licensing fee for the use of my photograph in Mr. Barty's video. And I sent that letter via sign for service just after 4 pm that day. For anyone out there thinking about whether it's lawful to use two processes in parallel, the simple answer is yeah. A DMCA takedown notification is a provision of US law, I've already said, and it has a functional equipment equivalent of a cease and desist. The host, YouTube in this instance, must comply with it. Because if they don't, they can end up in a situation where they can be sued for what's called vicarious liability. And that's not a position that Google, Twitter, Facebook or others want to find themselves in. No, because they've got their billions to protect. <clears throat> and whilst a cease and desist plays the role of stopping the use of someone's work from continuing, any artist is quite within their rights to also ask for fair payment for the use of work that occurred up to the date that it stops being used. And I'd like you to keep that fact in mind as I move on. Have they edited it out then, I wonder? As it turned out, my letter to Class and Influence Limited wasn't signed as received until 9.47am on the morning of August 6th. So as he sent that off, he's... The item was delivered on 6th of August. Oh, that is the day, Saturday 6th of August. I thought it was. Uh, I thought we were looking at a different date then. So he oh, so he sent it off on the Monday, and then he. Um, it's annoying when the bloody subtitles keep shooting up, but um, so it's taken five days to get there. That's the that's the Royal Mail these days for you. I mean, I agree with them going on strike for better pay and whatnot, but I, I do use them an awful lot less. Pretty much everything I, a lot of stuff I get for review just comes through as digital these days, streaming links and so on. Um, Games come through as review codes. It's stuff when you buy things from Amazon, physical items, they um, they come through from uh, individual couriers. The gig economy, who don't get don't get paid an awful lot, um, rarely does anything come direct through the Royal Mail. I have obviously no clue as to why or how it took five days for a first-class post letter to be delivered, when the average time is two. Suffice to say that the fact that my letter arrived on a Saturday morning after being sent on a Monday afternoon, was so far out of my ability to plan or control, it's ridiculous to even contemplate it. Oh yeah, because the Lady Dickhead was crying. How do they? How dare they say it, send a letter to me on a on a Saturday? Yeah, he had nothing to do with that. It's just Royal Mail delayed it. Duh. When I woke up that day just after 11 a.m., I fast became aware of two things. Firstly, that I had both a Twitter mention and a separate DM from someone called Lady Decade. <laughs> and second, that 9.31 a.m., YouTube had acted on my DMCA takedown notification and disabled the video in which my work had been used by Mr. Varty. Again, a situation outside my control because in my experience, YouTube can take hours, days, or weeks to action a DMCA takedown request. So it to happen on a Saturday morning was purely coincidental. Yeah, as I say, um, the, the seven day yeah, I, if any time a video gets marked as 
not suitable for advertisers. It says it can take up to seven days to resolve, <clears throat> but sometimes it's well, it's usually a day or two, um, usually a couple of days, but um, sometimes within a day, which is great. But then it shouldn't really happen in the first place. It seems to be happening happening an awful lot lately, and um, stuff is even happening with some video games I've mentioned before when um, I'm up. Some some cases, The Last of Us, which is obviously lots of zombies and lots of people being eaten. Okay, that's pretty, you know, a bit gruesome, but it's a video game. Surely, yeah, YouTube should be able to figure out that uh, just to sort of whitelist all those videos. Um, then it also tripped up over a few videos from the gameplay of a memoir, Blue, which is the most nicest looking gameplay you can have and the least offensive thing ever on the platform. Remember how I said that I'd learned from experience that dealing with responses to asking people to stop using my work can be a bit of a bumpy ride. A few of the things that Chloe Varty, also known as Lady Decade, said to me in their Twitter DM proved my gut instincts and led to me insisting on dealing with the situation in writing. Let's have a look. You can respond to my letter by, by emailing me at whatever. I generally do not discuss these situations via the telephone because although it allows for more fluid exchange of information, Critical details can be miscommunicated, so I prefer to keep things in writing to avoid such errors. <clears throat> she says, I prefer to speak over the phone as emotional context or tone can't be conveyed properly. You can record the conversation. You can, but, um, and if I, if I need to phone somewhere, I've, you, the, my Android phone, I can record the conversation. And I, my, my phone does that by default ever since I had a problem with a... Uh, buying a car about 10 years ago um, most of the time it's the, the conversation that will get recorded is just doesn't really matter um, and you can just get rid of it but anything that's really important uh, is worth you know, keeping hold of for future use um, or just for referencing back or in a lot of cases in most cases it's just usually because I phone somewhere to say book a doctor's appointment for example and they say you know can you come Monday at three o'clock etc and they're like yep that's great thank you very much bye bye and then I hang up the phone and I think when was it again because I just because I'm a man I wasn't really paying attention so uh, then I can just play back the the recording and go oh yeah there we go <clears throat> so yeah something like this I'd prefer to keep it in writing after closing off the conversation I really thought that Mr and Mrs Varty would take stock and get some advice either from their management agency or wait a few days to get an initial consultation with a solicitor to learn that yes, everything in my letter was both above board and followed the process expected under UK law. No, 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 no. That wasn't what she that <laughs> wasn't what she did at all. <coughs> she just went and made a right bloody mess, didn't she? Um I got a lot of hits on the video I made about it with all her lies. And uh very grateful for that and all the the watch time and the subscriptions which happened so thank you very much to everyone who subscribed based on my lady decade videos and all the other videos <sighs> fantastic after all my letter allowed ample time for that to happen nothing could have prepared me for what kicked off around 10 30 pm that night there were a barrage of activity in my email inbox and twitter mentions soon clued me into what had taken place the varties had uploaded a 20 minute long video to youtube that in my opinion, deliberately misrepresented both my claims and my correspondence. And it didn't take long for their followers to pick up the virtual pitchforks. Yeah, the, the number of people, because I saw I made uh, videos about uh, the Twitter threads at the time, the number of people who were still, <clears throat> still white knighting for this couple, still believing they were, they'd done nothing wrong and that they were the ones being done down. It's staggering. I mean, it's staggering how stupid people are. When they believe that kind of thing, they just believe what they're just simping for, you know, top hat gaming scam and lady decade. It's just the, the, the level of stupidity on this platform in any social media platform is just incredibly high. Um, I see it way too often. And it's like when you see, uh, say, Metal Jesus Rocks pulling another grifting scam or pulling out a lazy, a lazy bloody video like uh, he's recently going through. He's running out of ideas. He claims he's got problems with his teeth. Um, yeah, they get in the way of him talking. Uh, and he, so he's just gone back to... Because we know he's run out of ideas. He's run out of ideas for a long time. You know, He just makes videos about going um, 
uh, buying loads of games or getting free games, whatever, with uh, transphobic Reggie, Radical Reggie. And um, if he's not doing that, making those lazy videos, he's now just doing compilation videos. Because he's just got no ideas at all. And people go, oh, wow, what a great video. Yeah. Cause just have a look at some of the comments. I'm just like, God, just just realize that they run out of ideas and go and follow someone else. You don't even have to follow me or anything. Just just go and follow someone who's putting in some bloody effort into their YouTube channel, for Christ's sake. There was abuse directed at me. There were attempts to intimidate me into retracting my claims. There were threats against me and my family. I mean, that's, that's bang out of order. Really bang out of order. There were even at least two instances where people tried to dox my home address. Uh, those communications were quickly passed on to Police Scotland. They've put in requests with ISPs to find out the identities of those responsible so they can take further action. Well, I hope they can, whether or not they do. I'm trying to get you know identities of random people on the internet. I doubt that's ever going to happen. Never going to happen. But... Um, I hope they do. I mean, they really should take action against people like that, but... Um, yeah, I can't see it happening, but people who do that are just, just stupid beyond belief. You see, in her video, Chloe Varty was quite careful not to mention my name directly, but she did include just enough detail that anyone with a search engine could easily do so. so including the picture of uh, Ray Harryhausen and yeah, just enough information. So if that came to a court case, then she would, she would get uh, done for basically revealing his his details if that if it came to that because she supplied enough information in uk law this is termed jigsaw identification and is often cited in contempt of court actions or defamation cases many cases have held that this form of identifying someone is functionally identical to straight up naming them directly <laughs> sounds like i have watched this before but no i know um excuse me uh, I know enough about certain things to um, know that how, how certain things work, because uh, I'm cool like that. It also appears that at some point on August 7th, Mrs Varty was more concerned about the potential for the abuse that her followers and fans were directing at me, somehow landing back on her doorstep. She said in a Discord chat group, please do not contact or harass this guy from this Discord. He could sue me for targeted harassment. Any woman. As I understand it, that Discord group had about 500 members, but no similar statements were made to any of Mr. or Mrs. Varty's various social media channels. The video that they made together remained very much live and was subsequently republished in part or whole by other YouTube accounts who took the Varty's narrative at face value without question, repeating and amplifying it. Yeah, just bloody simps. For several days, the Vartys were seemingly content for their narrative to be circulated and shared, whilst I remained silent, and for good reason. If you ask any lawyer or law lecturer what you should do in the middle of a civil dispute, 99% of them will reply that you should STFU and say nothing. The other 1% will slap you upside the head for even asking, <laughs> and then tell you that, as attorneys Mark and Craig Wasserman routinely say, every day is shut the up Friday. You see... <laughs> Anything that you say publicly during a civil dispute is something that can, and probably will, end up going on the record. Oh yeah, and um, and they made that video, which they've they've now tried to they've made private, so you can't actually watch that video again. But uh, if you did if you did have it, if you did try to upload it where she's crying, then um, they could still issue a copyright strike. If they deleted the video, then they couldn't do that. But uh, yeah, they've just made it private, so. Yeah, they could throw a copyright strike if you tried to upload the video. So if you're on the receiving end of a legal claim, you can quickly find yourself in a worse position than the one you initially started off at if you go talking about it. In the modern age, publicly means any kind of communication broadly directed at a third party. So that naturally covers social media postings such as tweets, Discord chats, YouTube videos, and so on. If you're watching and now wondering, hang about, why did you upload this video then? That'll become clearer in a moment. Da, da, da. Getting back on track, the first I heard back from the Varties was a letter that arrived through my front door on the morning of August 11th. Oh, I, could, I could argue that um, it should be Varties without the apostrophe 
because it's not a possessive there's not a possessive pronoun following it but um, yeah that's uh, a moot point and you'll note it was dated August 8th a redacted personally identi uh, personally identifiable information but you'll see that it's brief and to the point Dear Mr McNeil, thank you for your correspondence received 6th of August regarding the alleged infringement of the portrait of the late Harry Harryhausen. Having read your letter and reviewed the footage without any admission of liability, we are prepared to agree to pay the requested amount of 47052. This is in full and final settlement of all claims that uh, either party may have against each other connected to or relating to this. Accordingly, upon receipt of our payment, please remove the DMCA copyright strike from our channel. It is understood if both parties complete, complete their respective steps, this will be the end of the matter. Could you please supply details how you'd like the payment to be made? I've also included a correspondence email address. Should this be easier for you to acknowledge receipt of the payment? Sincerely, Arvati. God, he's looking right. right it's like a child. Um, I assume that's her signature as well. Um, and he's supposed to be a teacher. Jesus. Uh, so, the thing is, as I understood it, it was... Um, the, the, the use of the foot, the use of the paying the money would be allow you use of the footage, uh, the picture in this case, for about six months. So I'm not sure whether it's six months or two years. So even if it's two years, then they could keep the video up for, I think it'd been up for about 18 months. They could keep it up for another six months and then they'd have to pay again. Or just edit the clip out of the video and then carry on. <clears throat> if it's six months, then there's a lot of money to be paid still. But um, yeah. They're going to, if they're going to include the clip going forward, the, you know, forever, they're going to have to keep uh, keep paying. Um, so they'd be better off. They'd be better off just paying and then clipping the bit out of the video. It's not in any kind of headed paper, nor is it from a firm of solicitors. But none of those points are relevant for civil claims in the UK because the court system encourages people to settle disputes directly where they can, and you don't need a solicitor to do that. The part I'm going to talk about is this. Having read your letter and reviewed the footage without any admission of liability, we are prepared to agree to pay the requested amount of £470.52. This is in full and final settlement of all claims that either party may have against each other connected to or relating to this. And that seems quite reasonable at first glance, right? Except there's one small problem. Now, using this wording, Mr and Mrs Varty presented a counteroffer to my August 1st letter stating that if I accept payment from them on their terms, it will cover any and all claims any party may have, etc. Given the date of the letter, their terms would have covered claims I might have relating to tweets, the Discord chats, the YouTube video that they'd uploaded on August 6th, and so on. Simply put, if I accepted their claims, the settlement would no longer be just about them using my photographic work without advanced consent. And that's something I couldn't agree to, particularly because their August 6th video was the genesis of a torrent of abuse directed at me, not to mention that many of the statements made in the video did not accurately reflect the facts of the matter and, in my opinion, crossed over a line into defamation. I hope you sue their arse into oblivion. On the morning of August 15th, I sent a reply to Mr <coughs> and Mrs Varty expressly rejecting their offer. I'm not going to publish that letter here because it relates to what I view as an ongoing matter. All I'll say is that I informed the Varties that any settlement offer would now have to take all the facts to date into consideration. <laughs> Fuck you, Farty Varties. On the heels of sending that letter, the very next day, I received an email from a firm of solicitors who stated that they'd been retained by the Varties. Oh, so they do understand. They, do, they are able to get solicitors without crying into their tits. And that any correspondence from that point on had to go through them. I thought I'd be dealing with competent, legally trained professionals and <laughs> with the Vartis, no. And in fairness, most of the correspondence between myself and the firm of solicitors was as I expected. Polite, to the point, and working towards resolving the situation. On the afternoon of August 22nd, I had an email where the solicitor asked for my bank details because they would be making recommendations for payment in relation to this matter. A reasonable enough request, so I sent in my bank details. And quite unexpectedly, and with no formal settlement or agreement in place, the law firm that made a direct payment of £470.52 into my bank account about 3.30pm on August 25th. Immediately I called up the firm to let them know there must be a mistake. There's been no settlement agreement. 
And to say that the reception staff were evasive would be an understatement, telling me it wasn't possible to talk to the party solicitor and I had to wait until they emailed me. Oh, the scam continues by those bastards. Two hours later, I got an email claiming that the payment had been made per the terms of my August 1st letter and that the matter was now settled. Mm. I probably wouldn't have sent my bank details at that point. <clears throat> Not until an express uh, amount had been, you know, or terms had been worked out on the amount. So what's the problem, you might be thinking? Well, to answer that question, we need to talk about an old contract law case in English law known as Hyde versus Wrench, a precedent that was set nearly 182 years ago and is still mentioned in court cases to this day. The case went like this. Mr. Wrench owned farmland and was willing to sell it to Mr. Hyde for £1,200, which is about £94,000 today if we adjust for inflation. Mr. Hyde thought the asking price was too high and declined to accept. Mr. The Wrench then replied offering the land for sale at a reduced price of £1,000 and waited for Mr. Hyde to respond. Mr. Hyde, through his solicitor, said he'd be willing to pay £950 for the farmland, but Mr. Wrench thought that offer was too low and refused to sell. Hyde then wrote back saying that he was now happy to pay the £1,000 asking price that Mr. Wrench had previously offered, but Mr. Wrench never got back to him. Sometime later, Hyde took Wrench to court in an attempt to force Wrench to sell the land to him for the thousand pound price. And the court basically said, not so fast. When you made your counter offer of 950 pounds, that extinguished Mr. Wrench's earlier 1000 pounds offer to you. It simply ceased to exist. You can't turn back the clock to the past and force Mr. Wrench to accept an offer that doesn't exist anymore. In the same way, the Varty solicitor tried to reach back in time to my August 1st letter, ignoring everything that happened since, and tried to claim that paying me the amount I'd asked for meant the situation was closed. Perhaps, perhaps the Vartis have been watching too much Doctor Who, good lord. I mean, Cher once lamented in song that she couldn't turn back time, and Johnny Hicks jazz beat her to that sentiment a year earlier. <laughs> Johnny Hicks jazz. Oh, God. Someone who actually gets the music I liked it when I was in the, it was in the 80s. 80, 90, 87, I think it was. Yeah, they had a, a big hit with Turn Back the Clock, and then they had a few songs after that. Uh, which, which weren't hits at all. Um, I think Clark Datchela, the main singer, he, um, or well, the singer, did a, he had a separate, did, a, did like a solo album and he had a song called Cl uh, Crown of Thorns. Um, but yeah, there were some other songs by, uh, I think I bought, I think I actually bought the album Johnny, Johnny Hates Jazz made because they had a sort of really stylish uh, look to them in the packaging. And, uh, and I like the music, and uh, it was a good album from what I remember. And I think there was a, a B-side, which was, um, I've not looked it up, so I may be slightly wrong. They had a B-side, which was just an instrumental called, I think, just Breaking Point, something like that. I can, I can remember, I've been playing it in my head. Um, and it was absolutely brilliant. And, yeah, great band, very underrated. <sighs> All the crap that gets through the charts, and then they didn't really get more than one song. Admittedly a little differently, since they wanted to turn back the clock and stop those wheels of time. If musicians know that it's not possible, how didn't the solicitor for the Varties get that memo? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Joking aside, I may only be a fourth year law student, but even I knew their solicitor's tactics weren't supported by facts because of the Hyde precedent. But despite phone calls, emails and letters stating as much, the firm of solicitors refused to send me information that would allow me to return the money. The only reply I got was on August 26 from the Varty solicitor who said, and I quote, I am not instructed to deal with the points of dispute that you are now raising. If you wish to raise the claim in relation to intellectual property, copyright, then you are, of course, at liberty to do so. So again, they're just continuing the scam. Now, in my opinion, that statement can be read as the firm knowing that their actions did not settle the matter. But instead, they hoped that paying the fee as originally offered would be enough to cause me to back down. Yeah, because they're just, they're trying it on. They're just bastard scammers. Or maybe at the time of making the payment, they thought I wouldn't know about the precedent set in Hyde. Even though every first year st law student around the world studying contract law basics are taught about this case. I, I'm not a law student, so I know certain things, but I didn't know, I didn't know about the, the 
the wrench hide case. Um, I'll be honest, I had to pause the video and just watch that explanation again because it sort of bent my brain a bit. But um, yes, <clears throat> it's interesting stuff. Because the solicitors had used the UK Fasters payment system, even my own bank didn't have the information on the account that the payment had come from. That's bizarre. I thought it would, it must say, well, might not say it initially when it's coming through, but I'm sure that um, the information would come through in due course. I don't know though, exactly. So I was at a dead end. Ultimately, I had no choice but to contact the parties directly and let them know that from a moral, ethical and legal standpoint, the money had to be returned to them. Because of the postal strikes that plagued the UK recently and the backlog of mail clogging up the system, we were sent a PDF copy of the letter by email at 10 a.m. on September 22nd, restating all the facts and giving them a choice to either send me bank account details, PayPal, Venmo, whatever, that would allow me to return the money to them or if they didn't reply, that I donate the £470.52 to the Clacton Food Bank. I hope it went to the food bank. It's a, it's a shocking shame we need food banks in this um, in this day and age, 2022. But um, I know I previously I put food bank links in these videos. Um, just just went talking about uh, this, this whole business initially because I was just... I didn't really want to make money out of them when it was just focusing on her directly and, and what they were up to. Um, scamming bastards, aren't they? In their name and consider the money to factor return to them by that means. I asked for their reply no later than 5pm on October 7th and since that time has now been and gone without response I have gone ahead and made the donation I said I would. Nice one! <laughs> Farty varties. And evidence of that payment will have been sent to the Varties by the time this video went live. Where does that leave the situation right now? In English law, you've generally got six years in which to bring a claim for damages and tort through the courts. Those limits are set out in the Limitation Act 1980. Though some matters like theft, personal injury, defamation, etc. They have their own separate limits. That's just a few examples. Personally, I remain optimistic that the Varties will open up a dialogue. Mm, I don't and this time take into account all the facts and circumstances starting from April 4th of 2021 through to the present day. I don't think they'll pay any further money um, but I just know that they must know their YouTube channels are fucking toast and they might have to actually go get a job <sighs> like they used to have and then they can yeah get a go get a well-paid job and then you can continue uh, having your Greek holidays. On February 20th of this year, Chloe Varty tweeted out, freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom from consequence. So I hope she takes her own words to heart and stands ready to address the consequences that flowed from the things that both she and her husband have variously said from early August onwards. Because there should be consequences when people very publicly claim somebody else is a scammer, a financial predator, a copyright troll and so on without any factual basis for those words, especially when those words are then repeated by many others. Again, with no regard to fact or truth. So let's just um, bring up those tweets. <clears throat> now, there's no actual dates on these. Uh, but yeah, the first one, well, I won't read out the, the, YouTube, the, the, the Twitter URLs because uh, we'll be here all day if I did that. Um, first one says, people always tell me to block and move on. However, this is proof it doesn't work. His life is spent posting vitriol online about content creators on Patreon and looking for ways to get past the block. Freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom from consequence, though. Well, you'll soon find that out, dear. Weird thing about YouTube comment sections. People write to me as though I'm not actually not going to actually be reading it. As if their comment is in an empty vacuum and they can say what they like with no consequences. Reality is, I'm probably the only person reading it unless... Well, she might have... Uh, shadow ban them. Then even then if you shadow ban them, shadow ban someone, um, like I'm sure they've shadow banned me, then if I commented on any of their videos, they wouldn't see it either. Nobody would see it. Only I would see it. And I wouldn't know my comment had not been seen by anyone unless I take that, yeah, if I make the comment, then take the video URL, post it in the browser where I'm not logged in, and then look at it and my video, my comment will not be there on the video. Um, 
but yeah, she'll just shadow ban people as soon as <coughs> as soon as they um, say something she doesn't like. So she just maintain a narrative that's all biased in her favour. And then um, replying to someone, at least with, with Twitter, you can't remove someone else's comments. So there's a, as I shared with other Twitter threads when I went through them at the time, there's an awful lot of replies to her tweets where you know, that people posted things that she will disagree with because they're scammers, um, but that they're quoting facts and uh, she can't delete them. But she says, exactly, Twitter is an open forum, so I'll point out the fact that you're, an, you're antagonistic and behave like a dog with a bone. Freedom of speech is not freedom from consequence. Consequently, everyone who's blocked you think you're an idiot who's not worth interacting with. Was she replying to me? <laughs> I don't know. Let's just go back to where we were. As I said early on in this video, I'm a very vocal advocate for the rights of all artists and creators. You could almost say that copyright is a necessity for artists to earn a living, gracious or otherwise. Yeah! <laughs> necessity for gracious living. Brilliant. That copyright is a necessity for artists to earn a living, gracious or otherwise. So, yeah, that's referring back. I won't bring up the picture now because I've not got it, I've not got it ready. Because um, <clears throat> I didn't know he was going to say that. But, um, yeah, one of the videos where they were to the Greek holiday, <clears throat> excuse me, had all the pictures of them you know, having a, a fantastic time on holiday, showing off the handheld games consoles in the sun and saying it's a necessity for gracious living. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about that before closing out. The very first copyright law to be written, the Statute of Anne, which came into force on April 10th of 1710, said in its introduction, whereas printers, booksellers and other persons have of late frequently taken the liberty of printing, reprinting and publishing, or causing to be printed, reprinted and published, books and other writings, without the consent of the authors or proprietors of such books and writings, to their very great detriment, and too often to the ruin of them and their families. I just um, read that back again. Whereas, it sounds like a starting halfway through a sentence. Whereas printers, booksellers and other persons have, have of late frequently taken... It sounds like there should be some, um, some extra commas. Extra commas. Whereas printers, booksellers, and other persons have, of late, frequently taken the liberty ooh, of print, take the rest, oh, stupid system. Whereas printers, booksellers, and other persons have, of late, frequently taken the liberty of printing, reprinting, and publishing, or causing to be reprinted, printed, reprinted, and published, books and other writings, without the consent of authors or proprietors of such books and writings, to their very great detriment, and too often to the ruin of their families. Oh, that's a... Uh, that's making my head hurt. It's just, it's, it's like a sentence that's, that's not quite finished. That's why it just feels a bit weird. This law recognised that people who had the technical means to reproduce the work of authors without their consent was ruinous to the very people who created the writings being copied. Artists of all kinds generally just want to do good work. And when someone else wants to make use of it, it's the artist that gets to set the terms of that use. If asked, they may be happy to simply be credited, request a modest fee in return. But that consent has to be gained in advance to be legitimate, and sometimes the answer will be no, possibly with an explanation given for the refusal, but that's not necessary and can't be demanded. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like um, <clears throat> when you have, someone might take a picture of something, excuse me, <clears throat> something that's happened in the street and that's been you know, like a disaster and it's been picked up on by all the press, and people have unwittingly just shoved it on Twitter going, oh, look at what's happened here on my way to work. And then they'll get 100, 100 replies from news organisations saying, can we use your picture for our article? We'll credit you. And uh, too often people will just reply, yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead. Completely just throwing away their intellectual property. Because if they just say, yeah, yeah, go ahead, then they won't you know, get any uh, money for it. Whereas if you just you know, wise up, and just say, yeah, if you pay me, pay me five hundred pounds for that picture or whatever it is. Just say, you yeah, pay me some money for for my picture, um, and then they they won't do that, and they'll just go on and find a picture posted by someone else, who will just go and say, yeah, 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 go on then. Um, but yeah, always stand by your intellectual property and make sure you get properly compensated for it. Also bears mentioning that, like many other situations in life, 
Silence does not equal consent. If you ask and don't get a reply, charging ahead and using an artist's work, regardless, might create more trouble for you down the line. <laughs> and boy has it. So when an artist's refusal to give consent goes ignored, <clears throat> or if they discover that their work has been used without an attempt to get consent beforehand, it's not copyright trolling when artists then use any lawful process to assert their rights. Whether that's sending a DMCA takedown notice, requesting a credit, sending a cease and desist, or even saying, hey, you've used my work, you're going to need to pay me, or any combination of the options open to them. That's their choice. And on that point, crediting an artist when you've used a work without consent does nothing except indicate where you found that work. The source itself might not have been a lawful use, and having a credit line won't get you off the hook from an infringement claim. This brings me to the extremely misunderstood concept of fair use, or fair dealing as it's known in some countries. Yes, there are exceptions in law that sometimes give you the right to make use of a copyright work without asking. And those exceptions tend to be very narrow and when an artist and end user disagree on whether a use is fair or not, it's the courts that make the determination. Nobody else. Platforms like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, so on, can't decide if a use is fair because... Well, they, they won't um, even get into that conversation because they haven't got enough people to deal with it. Because if they try to, they could wind up getting sued. Again, vicarious liability. Fair use or fair dealing is a bit like punching someone in the face and then trying to claim you were acting in self-defense. Just saying it isn't an instant Uno reverse card or get a jail free card or a magical mythical spell where you can add a disclaimer to your website, videos or whatever saying no copyright intended or all materials used here fall under fair use. Because frankly, that has about as much weight in law as a helium filled balloon whose string has come undone. As far as I'm aware, this is my video is fair use. I don't get the feeling I'm going to get sued and have a very sore bottom. <laughs> For clarity, all I'm saying is that the process of putting forward the legal defence of fair use is broadly similar to claiming self-defence, just in case anyone feels the urge to twist my words into something they're not or quote them out of context. Well, I've certainly not done that. And that seems as good a note as any to finish up on. I hope this clears the air somewhat. And I know some of the things I've said may create questions in your minds, but right now, this is as far as I'm publicly willing to go regarding any statement of my position. Thanks for listening. So, <clears throat> there we go. That's, I mean, that was a great video. And I do hope, I hope people link this to, even though they'll then get blocked on Twitter by the pair of them, I hope people link this video. If, you're not, if you've not been blocked by Lady Decade and Top Hat Gaming Man, and they're not difficult to find on Twitter, I've been blocked by them. Um, just take the URL to this video, to, to Martin's video, I'll put it in the uh, video description below, and go and um, yeah, just, just reply to their... Any, anytime they post one of their videos for their YouTube channel, just reply and say, have a look at this, and then, you know, comment uh, with the Martin's URL, and um, they will they'll block you on Twitter, but uh, they won't be able to um, stop your link from being seen by anyone else, unless because if you then try to post if you try to post a link on you on their YouTube channel, for example, they could just shadow ban you and get rid of you from their channel. Um, and quite frankly, I mean, I have a thing on my channel where if anyone posts a link on my channel in the comments, then it will just fall into the spam section. Uh, now, one, one, you know, occasionally people will post a comment, a, a video link comment that uh, genuinely is to do with, you know, is it like a reply or has context to my video. And sometimes I'll let those through depending on what it is. But sometimes I get people just saying, hey, check out my channel. Um, but more, more often it's just people sending spam links. Just bots sending out spam links to nefarious websites, and I don't want them on mine. I've, I've, there's been times when I've um, shown DJC's uh, Amico videos, and his comment sections are riddled with those sort of links, and he doesn't, he's not, he's not learned how to go into the settings and switch them off. I can't remember which setting it is because I've already set it, but it's the same one where you can stop swear words being, uh, you know, showing up in the comments. Um, let's see, say in the, in the subtitles. So I think, um, 
the video, one of the, one of the videos I made anyway, was that the one with, um, oh, I forget who it was now, I think it was the, one of the, yeah, one of the videos, the guy before John Riggs was saying, and he used a word, which I won't use here, and yeah, it just sort of blanked it out. Um, so there we go. What do you think of that? I thought that was, that was fantastic, and um, yeah, absolutely brilliant. More power to Martin. So, um, anyway, please like this video, share it with your friends. Yeah, post all your thoughts in the comments below. Do go and, I mean, in case we get more out of Martin, do go and uh, subscribe and um, yeah, check it out and subscribe to Martin. And um, you can also ring the bell, etc., like I'll ask you to do on mine, and so that you'll get notified anytime he makes a video. So, yes, so subscribe if you haven't already. Click on the bell for all the notifications when you subscribe. <coughs> Windy Pops. Ah. <sighs> I think I'll, I could, this video has gone on so long, I could do it in two parts, but quite frankly, I think I, do, I think I want to get it all up in one part, simply because this thing, they, they could then post a, a reply to it, and I don't want to ha end up having a part two straggling along when really part one could just, well, yeah, when I want to be then by then doing a reply to their video if they make one, so, because um, then I'll just be sort of be falling behind. But, um, yeah, we'll just put it out in one video. Anyways, cue Genesis. <laughs>